Bird Note presents. Judge is seven years old. She's a beautiful bird. Um, she stands about two, two and a half feet tall. She's got beautiful sort of different color feathers from a dark brown at the end going up to a lighter brown and then a white sort of tuft at the, the neck going onto the head. So she is a beautiful animal um, and we're very fortunate to have her. The part that you need to watch out for is obviously the beak and um, that helps to be able to get into the carcasses um, and to, to break them up. So when we agreed to take her on, I didn't realize that was for 50 years. But here we are, ticking away. <laughs> Hey there, and welcome to Threatened. I'm your host, Ari Daniel. In our last episode, we got to know the puffin, a bird much loved for its cuteness. And today we take a look at conservation efforts for a bird that's not so cute. Vultures are an often misunderstood and overlooked bird, but they play an extremely important role in ecosystems all over the world. This story comes to us from producer Ish Mafundikwa in Zimbabwe. Hey, Ish. Hey, Ari. Ish, I'm curious, what attracted you to vultures? I I would think most people kind of shy away from them because they think they're gross or ugly. Yeah, you're right. In general, people aren't exactly attracted to vultures. We are known here for the world-famous Victoria Falls National Park, and we're home to some of the more charismatic endangered animals. The so-called Big Five get the majority of their attention. Lions, elephants, rhinos, leopards, and buffalo. So it's easy to overlook the plight of the vulture. But I've reported on vulture deaths before. So I reached out to BirdLife Zimbabwe, and they pointed me toward the Victoria Falls Wildlife Trust and the work they are doing to combat vulture population declines. What's driving these declines exactly? A number of things, Ari, but primarily us human beings. Right, right, of course. There are numerous human threats to the vultures here, and I was curious about how they are being addressed. With human problems, sometimes there are opportunities for human solutions. Absolutely. So, Ish, you live in Harare, right? Yes, the biggest city in Zimbabwe. And I understand there are a lot of vulture conservation initiatives across the country, including in Victoria Falls, where you went for this story. But that's not close to Harare, is it? Not at all. It's about a 10-hour drive. 10 hours? Yes, but this was my first trip since the pandemic started. And I was quite happy to hit the road and spend some quality time with my truck. So I made it safely to Victoria Falls and headed to the offices of the Victoria Falls Wildlife Trust. Jessica Dawson, the trust CEO, welcomed me and introduced me to Judge, the white-backed vulture she described earlier. Unfortunately, Judge was found in the wild with a damaged wing, meaning that Judge can't fly and find food on her own. It's not easy for those protecting vultures. Many people don't understand the importance of these birds in the ecosystem. I mean, they're not the best-looking creatures. I know a lot of times they're not seen as um, being a a beautiful animal, but they actually are, and they're actually quite clean. They do bath every day, so you'll see them often going down to water um, after they feed to clean up and clean themselves off so that they get rid of all of the bits and pieces that might have been hanging on and, and clean off any parasites. Jessica has to be on the defensive about vultures because there's so much at stake. Five out of the six vulture species in Zimbabwe are threatened with extinction. And they play a crucial role as the janitors of our ecosystem. They clean up the carcasses that otherwise would just sit there and possibly spill over diseases. And recently in the last year, I think all of us are a lot more familiar with how that can affect all sorts of different species and the need to being able to have these beautiful birds to be able to help maintain our balance in our ecosystems. Organizations like the Trust are already doing what they can to ensure the vulture survives. For instance, they monitor vulture breeding in the surrounding national parks to see if their numbers are increasing. 
Roger Perry is the Trust Wildlife and Research Manager. His work takes him into the bush where he monitors vulture activity, which includes mapping vulture nests. So I am riding with Roger in his truck and um, it's through the bush, as you can hear the car being scratched by bushes on either side. Roger is taking me to see a white-backed vulture colony not too far from Victoria Falls. We are in a national park in a very beautiful part of the country. Everything is green and dense because we had very good rains in Zimbabwe this year. There's a lot of wildlife, but because it's so green, we can't see too much of it. You see the odd herd of elephants, giraffes, the omnipresent baboons and monkeys, and a lot of birds. Roger is an expert at keeping the truck on the road and also looking out for nests. I think I'll, I'll, let, I'll just have to call him Eagle Eye Roger <laughs> because he sees things that my city eyes don't see at all. So we're driving through the colony and um, hopefully we'll come across some more nests. We do come across quite a few nests and we stop under a tree where a vulture is sitting in a nest. Another one perches on a branch close by. I asked Roger if they could be a couple. Yeah, male and female, so it's a breeding pair. They mate for life, so they, they will be partners for, for life. A little bit earlier we watched a bird flying over us with some nesting material in its beak and uh, it went straight into a tree and then hopped across to another tree where the nest was. Uh, and there was a female sitting on the nest, so she was probably you know, sorting out the nest and the male was bringing the nesting material to her to mm. add to the, the nest. Yeah. Very responsible males, isn't it? Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> Vulture populations are decreasing rapidly. One reason is how they breed. Out with us in the bush is Orbert Peary. He works in vulture conservation in South Africa and knows a lot about them. They lay one egg, yeah, yeah. Um, they can relay another one if it's broken. Oh, so just one egg per year. And that's one of the problems. Mm. You know, they take a quite a long time to reproduce. So per year, you know, they'll only produce one chick. Uh, and there is obviously a, a mortality rate as well, depending on the environmental conditions and the threats, etc. And how long does it take for a vulture to mature to lay eggs? Seven years, that's when they start being adult and laying eggs. And it takes about 54 days for the egg to fully hatch. It takes about four months for the baby to leave the nest. So seven years to start breeding. And yeah. then um, with whitebacks, they normally, I'm not too sure about calves, but the whitebacks, they normally live between 40, 45 years. 45 years. Yeah. That's long. Yeah, it is. Or like a chicken. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, more like a parrot, I think. <laughs> Roger has been looking after the colony since 2014. He says there's been a 16% increase in nests within this colony over the past year. So it's, it's quite positive at the moment, mm. Mm. but um, we need to watch it quite closely. Mm. At this point, we take a lunch break. We parked the truck under a tall tree. A vulture lands in the branches above us, which is when we realized there was another vulture there all along. We are not quite prepared for what happens next. I think... So, Roger, you know all the good spots. We just heard the sound of uh, vultures mating. Yeah, absolutely. So this time of the year, the birds are quite active. The, the pairs are coming together. There's some sort of social interaction between the pairs. And uh, the one bird flew into, obviously, the mate that was sitting in the tree there. And they've, they've just been spending the last couple of minutes mating. The vultures' long reproduction timeline contributes to their rapid decline. But there's something else about its nature that makes it a target for poachers. And... Roger, what's going on here? Because I see a lot of vultures up there, very high, flying around very slowly. What what are they doing? Are they so looking are, for for food on the ground? Yeah, so vultures are soaring birds. They have got those very big wings. And um, what they do is they wait for these thermals, which is basically hot air rising. And in this case, you can see there's, there's birds all the way up. And you can see that thermal quite clearly just by looking at the birds. And they'll, they'll go up to move or looking for food as well. I see. And their eyesight is extremely good as well, probably about 10 times better than humans. So they can see 
Either carcasses or other activity of other birds from miles and miles away and then they will then go to that spot. That was Okay, they got brilliant eyesight as well, right? Eh? Brilliant eyesight, yeah. So I guess we change your name from Eagle Eye to <laughs> <Vasha>. Vasha. <laughs> This superpower of the vultures is also what makes them a target of poachers, the biggest threat to vultures. They give away the location of poached animals like elephants by circling overhead. The next day, I went to the Victoria Falls Safari Lodge to meet Moses Garira, the wildlife officer there. He could tell me about how the vultures' instinct makes them the enemy of poachers. When I arrived, the vultures were already circling high above and landing nearby for a feeding frenzy. Thus, because the lodge also doubles as a vulture restaurant, every lunch hour, the lodge lays out some meat, leftovers and trimmings from their kitchen in an open space. Moses told me they do this to supplement the vulture's diet with a safe food, meat that's not poisoned by poachers. Some of those poachers, they sometimes poison the whole elephant carcass hoping that all the vultures in the region will come feed and die, so that in their next illegal hunting, there won't be any vultures or less vultures to report them to the National Park Game Rangers. That Moses says that poachers go to great lengths to kill vultures, even sometimes poisoning an elephant carcass. Thus, because once the poachers kill an animal, vultures will start circling overhead, in effect reporting the poachers to the Game Rangers. Some of those poachers realized that using firearms to kill elephants is also reporting themselves to the game rangers. To avoid a detection, the poachers poison water holes or where animals leak natural salt. This ends up killing not just the targeted elephants, but other animals and birds as well. Local farmers also unintentionally play a role. Most of the farmers in the region practice subsistence farming and own livestock. So, if they find some of their livestock being killed by predators, they might want to find a way to get rid of the predator. That's when they come up with ideas such as putting poison on the left of a carcass, hoping that if those predators come to finish their kill, they feed on poisoned meat and all die. But forgetting that those predators are also very, very sensitive animals. Whenever Moses explains what a scenario is like when these farmers poison a carcass and then the vultures come to eat it. So imagine if I had put poisoned meat here, how many vultures I would have killed in just five to ten minutes. It means this whole flock which came here today can disappear on just one carcass. But remember, And it's not only the vultures directly poisoned which die, they are also indirect deaths. And imagine that all the birds which came here were all females, having babies back in the nest. That would also mean the number of babies who would have lost. Because if the mothers die here on the feeding site, it means the babies will also die in the nest. That is of starvation. Poisoning is by far the biggest threat facing vultures in sub-Saharan Africa. A few years ago in Zimbabwe, one poisoned elephant carcass killed almost a hundred white-backed vultures. After the break, what's being done about it? In July of 2020, the Victoria Falls Wildlife Trust took in a lappet-faced vulture with a broken wing. After about nine months in recovery, it's ready to be released back into the wild. And Ish was there to witness it. Before the release, Orbit secures a solar-powered tracking device onto the bird's back with plastic cables. The device connects to the mobile phone system wherever the bird flies, and it can be traced as long as the device is working. The devices are fitted onto the birds to study their behavior and movements. After fitting the device, it was time to release it into the wild. I go along to the opening in the bush where it's to be let out of a cage. Albert and Roger are going to open the door. Let's see what happens now. Now open and it oh, is coming out, it's jumped out. Can you see the device on the back? You can see the tracking device on his back. And Roger says it's about eight it's grams. Nice oh, it's spreading its wings. Oh, that's majestic. It's about two meters wide, eh? The wingspan. Look at that. Uh, it's looking at us, maybe saying goodbye. The wingspan is some, it's more than two meters, I think. 
Yeah, it's oh. in leopard face, it's hard to catch it. Uh, to know how many pairs are there. It's flying off, it's just took off. Oh, that's amazing, really beautiful. There it goes, there it goes, lands. So it can fly. Okay. How does it feel, Roger? Sorry? How does it feel? No, it's good. It's good to see this bird um, out. You know, it's a bit of a concern that it wasn't able to get airborne, but it was flying quite nicely. The vulture does fly quite nicely, but not for long, probably because he was cooped up for so long. He's taken back to the enclosure at the trust, and an attempt to get him to fly off is made the following day. We all go back to the open space where he is to be re-released. He flies a little bit longer than the day before, but then starts walking along the ground. So I leave Victoria Falls before the rehabilitated vulture takes off. But a few days later, it finally flies off and they are tracking it. The bird makes numerous stops, including at the place where it was found all those months ago. The tracking device orbit strapped onto the vulture has a story. It has been used before to track another vulture. The device was fitted onto the back of the bird and was sending signals of its whereabouts. Then one day, the tracker suddenly stopped sending a signal. After some days, the signal returned, but it seemed the vulture was flying along the highway. Orbit says they found this strange. Because our vultures don't follow the road, right? No, <laughs> they don't drive. <laughs> they followed the signal with the police, and the device was found in someone's home. So he invited the police to his home. Oh, yeah, he, he reported himself. Yeah, he reported himself. <laughs> now, do you know what happened to that individual? I think he was arrested. Poaching is not allowed in Zimbabwe, and especially with the vultures, they are critically endangered species. After four days in Victoria Falls, I'm back on the road. But before heading home, I stop over in Bulawayo, the second largest city in Zimbabwe. There I meet Josephine Maringa, a researcher at the city's National University of Science and Technology. Josephine has been studying the breeding of white-backed vultures near Bulawayo since 2016. Every year we have actually seen um, an increase in numbers. Uh, we started with about um, 12 uh, nests initially. After two years, we saw about 19. And then the 2020 surveys, I think we had more than 45 nests. So that's been quite exciting to see the numbers increasing. But it isn't all good news. There's still a threat to the colony, even while it's expanding. Of course, we've got some places where they are shifting because there is new settlements near those nests. So they're shifting uh, inwards towards the core of the ranch. But we're generally seeing an increase in numbers. So Josephine touched on another threat to the vulture's survival, human pressure on habitat. But just as human beings are a threat to vulture survival, they can also be the solution. Josephine is optimistic the birds and human beings can coexist. So the next stage is to go around communities and we are doing awareness campaigns, but it's not just really us sharing information. Uh, the ultimate goal really is to have people involved, like actively involved in um, setting up their vulture saves. The Community Education Project is a collaboration with BirdLife Zimbabwe. A few such community groups are already taking shape across the country. We're going to have communities having support groups, voucher support groups where people can actually tailor make their own conservation goals for the area and then we have them push those goals themselves. Crystal Dube, a farmer, leads one of the community groups in Gwai a wildlife-rich area north of Blawayo. He acknowledges a noticeable reduction in vulture numbers in his area, but he was not aware of the importance of the birds until bird life Zimbabwe educated him. If people don't understand the value and the importance of that bird, they might think it's a useless bird. But we have since realized that it plays a very important role within the environment, uh, particularly in terms of cleaning up carcasses, a reduction on diseases, it does help quite a lot. After Bulawayo, I got back in my truck for the five-hour drive back home. Back in Harare, there is another threat to vultures that I wanted to learn more about. So there is um, harvesting of birds to be used in the traditional medicine trade. 
where there's the belief that vouchers can enhance con, uh, contact with ancestors, look into the future, predict results. This is Fadzai Matsimbo of BirdLife Zimbabwe. Her organization and other stakeholders, including the Zimbabwe National Parks and Wildlife Management Authority, the custodians of flora and fauna in the country, created the Zimbabwe Vulture Action Plan. One part of that plan targets the belief-based use of vulture parts by traditional healers. So vouchers become a victim in traditional medicine where their body parts are harvested to support uh, this traditional medicine. Though it is not the most severe threat to the species, it does contribute to their diminishing numbers. Well, one can argue that traditional medicine has long been part of the African cosmology. You know, it's not a new phenomenon. But we also have to look at the sustainability side where, you know, we are a growing population, the beds are in decline, although we do understand that spirituality in Africans is a big component of our lives. It's no longer sustainable for us to be harvesting animal products for use in traditional medicine. One of the goals of the Vulture Action Plan is to discourage the practice. To this end, BirdLife Zimbabwe recently invited healers who belong to the Zimbabwe National Traditional Healers Association, Zinata, to a workshop in Harare. Some 30 healers showed up. We are just a little group here. Look, our association has more than 60 to 80,000 members, so we need to spread the gospel. George Candiero is Zinata's chairperson. It's a good thing that Bed Life Zimbabwe has called us for this meeting and hopefully start to something big. You know, we can use the media, we can use, you know, the, the, the social media as well and other forms of communication to try and conscientize our members, you know, the negative side of using or using these vouchers for traditional purposes, for spiritual purposes. So, Ish, the vultures in your part of the world are in real trouble, all over the world, really, although not as extreme in some places. So I'm curious, after spending time with all these people working to save them, what do you think is going to be the biggest help or most immediate solution? To be honest, I'm just so frustrated by the slow response from the authorities. Remember the tracking device Albert told me about earlier, which the police tracked to a person's home? Yes, yes, I've been wondering what happened with that. Me too. And even with all my investigative skills, I couldn't find anyone that would go on record to tell me what happened. But I get the sense that's because it wasn't really pursued. The law is clear. Killing a vulture means up to three years in prison or a more than $2,000 fine. But it doesn't seem like anyone is really going after these guys. I wonder if a punishment like that is the best deterrent. Well, certainly not if it isn't enforced. We can't just blame or punish the poachers, though. They do what they do because there's a market and demand. Right. And what frustrates me is that those people driving the industry don't seem to be held accountable either. That's true, too. However, Roger thinks with more regional cooperation, vultures still have a chance. We have a good population of vultures here. Uh, They don't belong to us. They move over several countries. We share them with Botswana and Zambia and even Mozambique and South Africa, uh, Namibia. So they are very vulnerable. We have started putting systems in place where the different countries coordinate on vulture conservation. So there are some positive uh, stuff happening. uh, And I think think, uh, vultures do have a chance. All I know is that after spending time with the vultures and learning about how important they are to our ecosystem, I want them protected with everything we've got. Studying vultures in and around Zimbabwe means covering vast distances. But on the other side of the globe, in the U.S., there's a team in the smallest town, in the smallest state, doing tiny work, banding little birds. People say, they always want to know, what's your favorite bird? All right, well, my favorite bird is the one that's in my hand right then. And so right at this moment, my favorite bird is a white-throated sparrow. Meet the bird banders of Block Island, Rhode Island, next time on Threatened. This episode was produced by Ish Mafundikwa and me, Ari Daniel. 
It was edited by Caitlin Pierce of the Rough Cut Collective, audio mix by Rob Byers, Johnny Vince Evans, and Michael Raphael of Final Final V2. Our theme song and original music were composed by Ian Koss, with additional music by Blue Dot Sessions. Threatened is a production of Bird Note and overseen by content director Allison Wilson with production assistance from Sam Johnson. You can find our show notes with additional resources, Bird Note's other podcasts, and much more at birdnote.org. Thanks for listening. I'll see you next week. <laughs>